listening to today's Community Cast. My name is Matt Morgan. I'm the pastor at Community Brookside, a new church plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are so blessed by your presence, and we hope that today's content will bring you joy. So this morning, we're going to uh, start a new sermon series. It's been a while since I've done a series, and so I've decided to work on one called Called versus Called Out. So... Do you understand what a a vocation is, right? Like, I I want us to understand what a vacation is. But what what is a vocation? Anybody know? It's It's your job. Right, but a vocation, I think, is a little bit. It's something a little bit stronger. You don't say, uh, "Hey, I'm going to go to my vocation today to do my vocation." Right? We don't say that. We we kind of uh, simplize it. We make it. We go to our job. I think vocation is something a little bit deeper. So vocation comes from the Latin word voco, which means to call. You can also call it voice. Right? So uh, it tells you in the dictionary to see the word voice when it talk about vocation, which is weird to me. It's our employment, our calling, our occupation, our trade. It's a word that includes professions as well as mechanical occupations. A vocation is something that you do, but it's bigger than it's something that you are. Your voco, your vocation, is also your voice. Latin has a noun that's very similar, vox, right? Like when we turn up the volume, like if if you've ever worked, how many of you have ever done anything with sound? Like soundboard operator, ever recorded, like, um, you, how many of you have ever, like, made your own CD? Yeah, lots of us in this place. All of us are so vastly talented that we've all come up with, right? So when you, when you talk about Vox, Vox is another word for the vocal channels when, when people are singing. So V-O-X is that word, and it's Latin. But it's really strange when you think about the word Vox because it has the same voco beginning in Latin as vocation. So your vocation is also your voice. And the verb, it's this weird sense of like to throw something or to drive out sound. Your vox, your voco, your voice drives out sound, which is from within you. There's a pastor, his name is John Mark Comer, and he's the founding pastor of Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon. It's a huge church, and he's a very influential author and pastor And in his book, Garden City, Work, Rest, and the Art of Being Human, he writes this. The word vocatio can be translated to voice. Man, that's a lot to say. Your vocation is your voice. The Quakers have a saying that I love. Let your life speak. Finding your calling is about finding your voice. What cuts over all the din and drone of the other 7 billion people on earth. The tune and tone that only you can bring to the table. Calling isn't something you choose, like who you marry or what house you buy or what car you buy. It's something you unearth. You excavate. You dig it out and you discover it. We usually ask little kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? I wonder if we're setting them up for failure with that question. Maybe a better question is, who are you? What do you think God made you to do when you grow up? That, my friends, is the question. Who are we? How are we hardwired by our maker? What is it that God has in mind for us the day that we were born? These are the questions about calling and vocation. I was brought up in a culture that essentially said, John Mark, you can do anything you put your mind to. If you work hard enough, if you believe in yourself, if you're patient, you can do anything. Everybody heard that before, right? This is such a middle class and above American way to think. Nobody in the developing world would ever talk like that. And if you're a millennial and you came of age during the Great Recession, fewer and fewer of us talk like that either. But still... One of the reasons we're so disillusioned with our economy right now is because somehow this idea of I can be anything I want is bred into our ancestry. And it's not all bad. It it gave me the courage to dream and ideate and step out in life. But it's also dangerous because sadly, it's not true. I can't be anything I want to be no matter how hard I work at it or how much I believe in myself. All I can be is me who the creator made John Mark to be. If we fight the image of God in us, even if we succeed for a short run, it will come back and eat us alive. 
I'm going to repeat that because that's the important part. If we fight the image of God in us, even if we succeed for a short run, it will come back and eat us alive. For all of us, our vocation is our calling. It's what we do. It's who we are. It's what God made us to do. And not always does that mean that we're going to be preachers or missionaries. Oftentimes, our calling is how we incorporate our faith into our daily lives. It's how we live in response to who God made us. So I've talked in here about how I've worked a number of jobs. I used to work at Mazio's when I was a little kid. I started when I was 16 years old, uh, and I had a lot of fun with it. It was a part-time gig, and, and it was just because I knew God was calling me into the church. I needed something to do to earn money to get back and forth to church and school and all the other places and have money to do the things I wanted to do. But I knew God was calling me to the church. Then I got older and worked part-time in youth ministry and then got a full-time job working at at t Wireless. And I was good at my job, right? I was really good at my job. One time, uh, I was sixth overall in the whole corporation, right? So at t nationwide, actually kind of a worldwide company now, I was number six in the entire company on the number of contract extensions I did. Like, I was really good at telling people that I can fix your issues. We've got to get you under a new contract. We've got to work everything out so it's better for you in the long run. And I got to benefit from that. I was really good at what I did, but I hated every minute of my job. Because every day I would get up at like 5 o'clock in the morning and have to be at work by 6.30 and then uh, sit on phone call every day hour after hour with just very short breaks in between with people berating me, telling me how horrible the, the service is and how they, uh, literally I've had people tell me how horrible I am because of the company I work for. People told me that it was my fault that their phone wasn't working and they were going to burn down my house. Like that's the little perspective. Like that's what people deal with every day. So friends, I invite you to not be those people on the other end of the phone, right? I was good at my job, but I hated every minute I had to get up and go to work because it wasn't what God was calling me to do. Have you ever felt that before? Have you ever felt like, yes, I, I'm good at this thing or I can do this thing, but that's not what I want to do. Sometimes we, we settle. And the hard part is, is sometimes we settle into something and we stay there. And we can't do that. I can't be anything I want to be, no matter how hard I work or how much I believe in myself. All I can be is me, who the creator made John Mark to be. If we fight the image of God in us, even if we succeed in the short run, it will come back to eat us alive. I had to leave my job at AT&T. It was literally killing me. And so I told my pastor that I worked part-time for, I will come on full-time. I just need $1,200 a month. As a young person, I thought, that will be, give me by. That'll, that'll be fine. $1,200 a month is $14,400 a year. It is not enough to live on. But I worked for the church full time. And God made it work. And I was blessed because of it. I was able to grow myself, grow my faith, grow my family, and grow in other opportunities that led me to this place here and now. Sometimes we're going to have to branch out and do things that answers the call that we know we have on our lives, even if it's uncomfortable or hard. Do you know the difference between a calling and being called out? What does it mean to be called out? Anybody? You are in trouble. What do the kids call it? Put you on what? Put you on blast, right? So the cool kids say, I'm not cool. I don't say that. So being called is very different than being called out. When you're called out, it means you're being told that you've done something wrong. How many of you have been called out in your lives? How many of you deserved it? Yep, yep. Being called out is something that is good and it is required because sometimes we get a little big for our britches, as my grandmother would say, right? And sometimes people need to knock us down a peg to remind us who we are and who we belong to. Being called out means to confront one about one's misdeeds or unpleasant behavior. That's the dictionary definition. It can mean to challenge someone from something they have done. It can even mean to challenge somebody to a fist fight, right? When you call somebody out, I'll meet you behind the Starbucks at 4.30. Nobody fights behind Starbucks. That's weird. Like, that's, find, find a better place. <laughs> being 
somebody who gets called out means you're put on blast. It means your attention is being turned to your faults. Being called out is not fun, and it is never, ever easy. Oftentimes, we get so wrapped up in the idea that God calls flawed people into do ministry, right? If we look at every biblical character that has ever done anything, every one of them has a problem or two or three, right? Right, or lots. God uses flawed people, and sometimes we stop there, and we just say, well, God can use you. You're flawed. It's fine. But almost every single circumstance in Scripture, God either calls somebody out for acting like a fool or sends somebody to act on God's behalf to call them out. Knowing that all people are flawed, God selects those he sees fit to do specific jobs for him. It's just that sometimes people's flaws need to be worked on. So that initial work of God isn't nullified, right? Let me give you an example. If you perhaps had a problem with alcohol and one of your friends noticed that about you and said, hey, Matt, why don't you go to AA? And you're like, well, yeah, that sounds awful, but you're right, I probably should. But the next time you see that friend and that friend is drunk, what are your thoughts? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Like, shut up, you can't speak into my life. Look at you, like you're, you're no different than me. Sometimes when we see the people of God acting silly, it nullifies the work that God is trying to do. Likewise, if the church doesn't look like Jesus, the church's message goes unheard. This is why sometimes there needs to be a prophetic voice that calls us out on our flaws in order to bring us back in line with the plan and the purpose that God has for us. God calls us, but sometimes we really need to just be called out too. So these next few weeks are going to be looking at stories that include a call from God and a call out from God. But we're going to start today in a little bit different scenario because we're going to see what happens when people aren't willing or aren't brave enough to call somebody out for acting a fool, okay? So today we're going to look at a story of somebody I think most of us have heard of. Have you ever heard the name Samson? Is that because you know somebody named Samson or because... (laughs) Because there's a story in the Bible about a man named Samson. And you, if you went to Sunday school at any point in your life, you probably should have heard this story. Samson was a very strong man. He was somebody who was almost like, um, I think he was like a Superman almost. Like he was like a biblical Superman. What do you, what do you know about Samson in the Bible? Anybody have anything they know? Long hair. Long hair. Do what? Long hair, had long hair. What, what are some other things, right? Got muscles. Is that what you're doing back there? Flexing for me? <laughs> Oh, you were just running your hands? Oh, I misinterpreted that. <laughs> no, she was flexing. Anybody else know anything about Samson? He was strong, had long hair. What else? He was a judge. He was a judge. So he didn't wear the long robe. He wasn't like sitting on a, a bench like we have now. It's a very different description and a very different understanding of what a judge meant. But there was a period in Israel where the judges were in charge of all of Israel. So if there was an issue, if you got in a, a fight with your neighbor, you would come before a judge and they would settle the quarrel. And there wasn't just one judge, there were lots of judges all throughout Israel, and they took care of the people. So yes, he was a judge, he had long hair, he was totally ripped, what else? Anything else? He liked a girl, girl, right, we've heard the story of Samson and Delilah, yes? Not Delilah, anybody know that? Know that, you're right? That's like a call in, like love songs for your, no? Okay, all right. I know that. Um, All right. So I remember that when I was young, I used to picture Samson looking like my dad. Have any of you seen my dad? Some of you who are relatively new, you probably don't don't know my dad. My dad is an interesting character. He has a very big floppy mustache and hair that goes down to here. And my dad is is pretty buff, like for being a a man of age. I will say that. (laughs) Because I bet he's watching. I love you, Dad. Uh, But my dad, is he's pretty buff. And so I always pictured Samson looking a lot like my dad. As a matter of fact, the one time my dad got a haircut that I remember, he came home, got out of the van, and the dog ran up and barked at him because he didn't recognize my dad. He has always had long hair my whole life, and I've always kind of pictured my dad and Samson as the same person. It's a weird, weird thing. 
But Samson, from the time before he was born, was obliged to what's called a Nazarite vow. Does anybody know that word? Have you heard that before, Nazarite? What does it mean? Yes, so that's exactly right. So the, the story of Samson's birth is very much like every biblical story you ever hear. Like the poor woman is barren, she can't have a baby, and an angel shows up and says, you're going to have a baby, right? Like that's, we, we hear that a lot in scripture. So the angel appears to her and her husband and says, you're going to have a son, um, he's going to be awesome, he's going to be the one to deliver your people from the hands of the Philistines, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but in order for him to do what he's called to do, he's going to have to be a Nazarite from birth. Now, a Nazarite vow is usually something that somebody would do between like a 30-day and like a 120-day max period. Like you only do it for a shorter period of time. You don't shave your beard. You don't cut your hair. You don't drink alcohol. You abstain from all things unclean, and you are dedicating that time to God. It comes from the book of Numbers, and I'm going to have this on the screen. You can follow along here from Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. It says this, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite, they must abstain from wine or other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. They must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as they remain under the Nazarite vow, they must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the seeds or skins, because, you know, seeds and skins of grapes are delicious. Um, verse 5 goes on, During the entire period of their Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must let their hair grow long. Throughout the period of their dedication to the Lord, the Nazarite must not go near a dead body. Even if their own father or mother or brother or sister dies, they must not make themselves ceremonially unclean on account of them because the symbol of their dedication to God is on their head. Throughout the period of their dedication, they are consecrated to the Lord. It was a big deal. So these are just a few of the small pieces that make a Nazarite vow important, but there was more to it because you were expected to follow every single law of Moses so that you would not become unclean. So that means every other law, these are specific ones that make you like, this is a Nazarite specific thing. You have to do these things on top of what you're already doing. So they have to follow the dietary laws. That means no shrimp, no crawdads, no lobster, no um, catfish, no, like all the different things that people are required to do means you, specific temple rituals. You have to do sacrifices on this day. You have to do it at this time. You have to do it in this way. All those things added upon was this Nazarite vow. So now you've got all those things, and then you've got to not cut your hair, not shave your beard, don't get drunk, don't eat grapes. Lots of stuff. But during that period of time, you were dedicating that time to God. The weird thing is it's usually between 30 and 120 days when people do these vows, but from the time before Samson was born, he was called to be a Nazarite from birth. So can you imagine how long his hair was, right? What would you do with that much hair? Like just big, <laughs> big hair thing, right, on the top of your head. I'm sure he had a really big scruffy beard too. He was chosen by God to lead the Israelite people as a judge during the time of the judges against the tyranny and the wrong religion of the Philistine people. Now, who else was a Philistine? Who do we know was a Philistine? Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine, like big, big guy. They have been fighting with the Philistines for a long, long time. So just so we're clear, this time that we're talking about comes before David and Goliath. This is the period of the judges when we know that there is no king yet, and they're still battling between the Philistines and the Israelites. In this first sermon of this sermon series, we're going to see what happens when there's no strong call out. When somebody is, you know, if somebody's being called to do something, we're going to see what happens if somebody messes it up and nobody says anything to him. So we're going to look at the story of Samson. The story of Samson that we're going to start with, you can find it if you want to read the whole story. It's only a couple chapters long. It's from Judges 13 to Judges 17. Four chapters. It's awesome. Read the whole story. But I'm going to pick up some of the highlights today. So we're going to start in chapter 14. But in order to do that, we've got to read just a couple small pieces from 13. So here's what it says in Judges 13, verses 1 through 5. It says in verse 1, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. 
So from that first sentence, what do we know? What is the first word? Again, Again right? So this is one of the problems of the Israelites. They continually do wrong in the sight of God over and over again. And so it starts out again, the Israelites have done wrong in the sight of the Lord. It's just like, this is how the book of Judges continues, right? So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for how long? 40 years. It's a long time. I'm 40. This is what 40 looks like. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's so old. So old. So it continues on in verse 2. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless. Like, duh. Thanks. Thanks for rubbing it in. You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. And then it says this, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Friends, wouldn't it be easy if God just miraculously showed up in your life, maybe an angel says, and here's what your purpose is. You are going to have a, have a the thing and do that thing, right? Like that's, how awesome would that be if God did that? It doesn't usually work like that very often anymore. And I wish it would. But we can see here that he has a calling, clear. An angel shows up. He's going to be the one who takes the lead in delivering the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. And then we can skip down at the end of chapter 13, verses 24 and 25. It says this, the woman gave birth to the boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him while he was in Manea, sorry, Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. So far we know that Samson was a miracle from the Lord. His birth to a barren woman was a big deal. And she was to dedicate Samson back to God from the moment that he was born, from even in the womb, he was not to cut hair, no drinking wine, all of those things that a Nazarite was called to do. And at the end of the chapter, we see that he was blessed by the Lord and he was stirred by the spirit of God. God was with him as he began to live into his calling as a judge over Israel. But soon, Samson's own desires would get in the way of what God had called him to do. So just as a reminder, we talked about it half a second ago, Samson was a Nazarite and his vows meant that he had to follow every single law of Moses and no drinking of the booze and don't shave your face, don't cut your hair. But we're going to see here how sometimes Samson did what Samson wanted to do instead of doing what Samson was supposed to do. You ever done that before? Yeah. Mm. Sometimes it's fun for a minute. And then those decisions have repercussions, like we're going to see. All right, here we go. You can follow along in Judges chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Here's what scripture says. Samson went down to Timnah and there saw a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives? And let, let me just be very clear. It was different back then. Don't marry your relatives. Uh, but isn't there somebody acceptable like in, among your relatives or among your own, own people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines for at that time they were ruling over Israel. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and his mother, and as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn apart a young goat. But he told neither his mother nor his father what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. I feel like there should be more detail about what it looks like to rip apart a lion with your bare hands. Anybody ever done that in here? Just me? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I haven't either. Do what? Yeah, let it all, yeah. It's a, it's a very strange comparison. He tore apart a lion like he was tearing apart a goat. 
Who tears apart a goat? Like all of that is just weird. Do what? Right. His, yeah, like no, no lion pieces. Like, sorry, it's a little lion on my shirt. Yeah, it's, it's weird. All of that is weird. Like, there's a whole lot of that story. It's just, it's just biblical, right? Like, it's just a really weird supernatural thing. So, after deciding that this Philistine woman is the one he wants to marry, he goes back to his homeland, gets his parents, and says, "Hey, let's go get her." And then they come across a lion. Obviously, Samson rips the lion apart, and then they just go on their merry way. And it says that he did not tell his mother and his father. Why would you not tell your mom and dad? I'm, I would be a little braggadocious in that moment. Like, hey, I ripped apart a lion, no big deal. Like, you know, it's fine. But he said nothing to his parents about it. And this is where the story gets set up for something strange to happen in a moment. So now to recap, this holy man of God who's called to lead his people out of the hands of the Philistines has now decided that he wants to marry what kind of woman? And what kind of rules is he supposed to follow as a Nazarite? All the laws of Moses, right? Let me just read to you one of those laws of Moses. And it says this in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. Do not intermarry with them. And that means anybody in the land of Canaan. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Strike one, Samson, strike one. Also, according to the dietary laws of the Jewish people, they can't eat anything that touches a dead body. In some cases, like if a rodent or a specific type of bug falls in, like let's just say you have a little jar that you have made and thrown like a clay pot. You've made this uh, with your own hands and you fired it to make it actual clay pottery. Um, You've gone through a lot of trouble to do this. If something falls into that pot that's unclean, a rodent or a bug, and it has flour in it, not only do you have to throw the flour out, but now you have to destroy the whole pot. Like that's how strict the dietary laws were. You can't have anything unclean. These rules are serious. And Samson, God's judge, chosen to defeat the tyranny of the Philistine rulers, has now made it very clear that his needs are more important than anything else because he wants to marry a Philistine woman. He's killed a lion with his bare hands, and in a moment we're going to see that he feeds his parents food out of the belly of this lion. It's absolutely crazy. The story continues on that they go back home after, you know, he's really excited about this beautiful Philistine woman. They go back home. They've planned the wedding date. They're going to get it all set up and ready to go. And so finally, the date arrives. They've gone home back to, you know, Israel. And now they want to go back to the Philistine area where they're going to get married and get married. On the way back, as one does, uh, Samson decided he wanted to go see the dead carcass of the lion. Celebrate his victory. I ripped that thing apart with my bare hands. So as he goes over to the carcass of the lion, he sees that inside the belly of this dead lion, there's this beautiful bee's nest. What do bees make? Honey. So he decides, I'm going to go ahead and reach into the carcass of this dead lion and pull out honeycomb. And I'm going to eat some of it because it's delicious, honey. And I'm going to go give it to my parents. So now they've eaten some food out of the belly of a dead carcass, which is detestable to God. This is in the, the, the regulations and the rules. And now we see that Samson's needs, his desires, his wants supersede the promise that has been made for him about his life and what he wants is what he gets, right? Friends, it's kind of like, hey, AJ and Bethany, I want you guys to come to dinner at my house tonight. You cool with that, dinner at my place? Great. Be there at 6, bring a bottle of wine, I'll have dinner. You guys show up. I've made this beautiful spread of dinner. It's a little random. There's a ribeye steak, there's a chicken breast, and there's like a random salad. Uh, And 
uh, we eat a delicious dinner, and then at the end of dinner, I say, how'd you like everything? Oh, it was really good. Uh, you're a great cook, Matt. I didn't cook it, my wife did. Uh, she's a great cook, great. Um, by the way, every piece of food I gave you, I got out of the dumpster behind Reese's this afternoon. It's, I, no one should do this. Hey, mom and dad, I got this honeycomb from you out of the carcass of a dead animal. Like, that's just awful. Sometimes the things that we do impact other people. So without even thinking about it, Samson caused his parents to unknowingly sin. They were eating food that was detestable in the sight of God. They became unclean because of something that he did. And he never even said anything about it. It'd be worse if I was like, <laughs> I fed them food out of the garbage and they didn't even know. It's awful. Yeah, well, enjoy your food poisoning. It's fine. Sometimes the things that we do affect other people in a negative way. And Samson's story is full of those moments. We're going to continue on here, and I, I, I want to get through this as quick as I can. I, I get off topic a little bit. But during Samson's wedding banquet, he, uh, he posed a challenge to his Philistine friends that he was making. So there were these 30 guys that basically became his attendants at his wedding down in this Philistine area. And he says, hey, I've got a riddle for you. The riddle is this. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. And he says, if you can figure out that riddle within the next seven days, as long as this feast is lasting until my wedding day, if you can figure that out, I will give you 30 pairs of clothes, one for each of you. But if you can't figure it out in seven days, you each owe me a pair of clothes so that I get 30 sets of clothes. And I... Sets of clothes, I don't know why that's so important. I guess clothes were expensive back then. Um, it's not like going to Target and just getting clothes. You have to like manufacture them and make them and fit and all this stuff. So it's kind of a big deal for them. The, the riddle was odd. And for three days, the guys who were there couldn't figure it out. They had no idea. Well, I don't know what he's talking about. So they went to Samson's new wife and they said, all right, listen, tell us, if you would, what this riddle means because otherwise we're gonna burn you to death and kill your parents. So, okay, this Philistine woman is now absolutely crushed because she's gotta figure out what the problem was. She's gotta figure out what the riddle was, get the answer from her new husband and tell them before they murder her. So she came to Samson that day. Samson, please tell me, do you love me? Tell me the riddle. He's like, no. Day, next day comes. Can you please just tell me? Because it's, it's a really big deal that I know. Well, how come you haven't told me this? I'm going to be your wife. Why haven't you told me all this stuff? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Finally, she just nags him and bugs him so much that he tells her that, you know, what, what the meaning of the riddle is. And so on the day of the wedding, Samson's just chilling. He's like, all right, this is where I got my new clothes because they can't figure it out. I've got this. And sure enough, the men show up. And Samson says, all right. It's my wedding day. What's the answer? And they say, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? They had figured it out. So now Samson was on the hook for 30 sets of clothes because he was prideful and he thought there was no way the Philistines could have figured that out. So now Samson's got to find a way to get those 30 sets of clothes. So what does he do? Well, we can read it. In Judges chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, it says this, Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. It's not a very nice way to talk about your new wife. Verse 19 says, then the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home and Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. Samson was so prideful, they'll never get it. I'll make this bargain. They'll, then they'll have to give me all their clothes. He knew that he was going to win and then didn't because he gave the answer to the riddle to his new bride. So he was responsible to give them the clothes. So he goes down and kills 30 guys. Again, we can see that something that Samson has done causes hurt and pain for other people. And what, is, what, what do people say about that? What, what do you think that they say? Nothing. No one says a thing to Samson yet. 
So Samson gets lonely. He's, his wife has been given to another man, and he doesn't even know it yet. So he shows up at his new wife's father's house and says, I'm ready to sleep with my wife. And he says, oh, I, sorry, no, I, I gave her to somebody else because you left. And so how about her little sister? You want to you wanna marry her sister? Samson was ticked. And so the story goes that he tied 300 foxes together by their tails and lit a torch and tied the torch to the tails of those 150 pairs of foxes and let them loose. What happens when you tie fire to the back of an animal and they run wild? Bigger fire, right? So now it says in scripture that every uh, vineyard, all the standing grain, the olive groves, all of that of the Philistines were destroyed because Samson was so mad. Samson was getting even to his father-in-law and the people that his father-in-law come from because Samson didn't get what Samson wanted. I want my wife. I want 30 sets of new clothes. I want honey, right? All the things that Samson wants, Samson usually gets. And if he doesn't, clearly he's going to burn down everybody's stuff. So the Philistines, in return, get angry, as one would when your livestock and all that stuff is gone. And so they send a 1,000 men to go find Samson. And those 1,000 men begin to camp outside of uh, uh, Judah, where Samson is now hiding in a cave. And so the men of Judah get worried. Why have you come up against us? We, we haven't done anything wrong. We know that Samson's here among your, your friends here, so we're going to kill him. Wait, don't kill him. Let us go find him. So 3,000, so we have 1,000 Philistines are setting up side, you know, camp outside of Judah. 3,000 Israelites say, all right, let's go find Samson. So they spread out, and they finally find Samson hiding in this cave. And they say, Samson, what have you done to us? Don't you understand that these people rule over us and have been ruling over us for 40 years? You are causing calamity on us. So let's go. You're just going to bring me out there? Yeah. All right. Well, just don't kill me, but you can wrap me up in as, however much rope you want. Tie me up and take me to them. That's fine. On the way out, they're walking Samson out to go meet the Philistines. They're going to give him over to the Philistines so that he can face punishment and most likely die. Uh, because Samson is so strong, because of his Nazarite vow, because of this supernatural spirit of the Lord resting on him to deliver the Israelites from the Philistines, on the way out, he breaks these brand new ropes that have tied him together. And it says that he picks up the jawbone of a donkey, which is random, right? Random jawbone of a donkey hanging out. He picks it up and he slaughters all 1,000 of those Philistine men. The only thing the Jews ever said to him, the Israelites ever said to Samson was, don't you realize the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? That's the extent of all the call out. You've now eaten whatever you've wanted. You've done whatever you've wanted. You've taken wives. You've uh, you know, lit people's houses on fire. You've done anything you wanted. Don't you realize that these people are ruling over us? That's it. No, you've done wrong. No, hey, we should have probably done something a little different in this moment. It's a little bit soft, isn't it? There is never this, and you have to forgive the phrase because Jesus isn't around yet at this point. You have to, there was no like come to Jesus moment, right? Where someone tells Samson that the trouble that he has caused on account of his pride and conceit is ruining the Israelite people. There's no speech given by a prophet or an angelic encounter calling Samson out for the way he's behaved, the way he's treated others, and his self-seeking lifestyle. It just doesn't seem right. And the entire rest of Samson's story comes about because no one was willing to stand up to him and tell him that what he was doing was wrong. The story of Samson continues on. He meets this beautiful woman, another Philistine woman that he shouldn't be with, named Delilah, right? And they end up getting married. And the Philistine rulers, again, show up to Delilah and say, hey, we're going to murder you if you don't find a way to deliver Samson to us. And so she eventually tricks Samson into revealing what it is that makes him so strong. He says, my parents made a vow for me when I was a baby, and I can't cut my hair. So in the night, she cuts off his hair. 
and the Philistines rush in and they gouge out his eyes. And Samson tries to fight back, but because his hair has been cut, because the Nazarite vow is nullified, he has no supernatural strength anymore and he's taken as a prisoner in chains into a prison where he is made to uh, uh he's, he's basically put on the 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 what do you call this thing with an ox with the the what yoke. yoke yes thank you he puts on the yoke of an ox and then has to mill grain for them a blind supernaturally powerful man has lost everything and is now forced to grind grain like a donkey around a, a mill Everything he had, every single opportunity that God had given him, he ruined because it was all about himself. Friends, that is our story if we're not careful. That is why we have to fill our lives with people who love us enough to tell us we're being idiots when we're being idiots, right? We've got to fill our lives with people who are not afraid to call us out when we do wrong so they can keep us in check because God wants to use us and doesn't want us to come to ruin. In his last act, Samson was brought out of the, the grain mill and he was tied to a big column in the middle of a pagan temple where all the Philistines came to gaze on their strength. Look at us. We've caught Samson, the one who destroyed all of our villages and our grain and all of our stuff. He's been murdering our people. He's weak now. We've got him. So Samson in that moment knew that if he asked God for strength, that God would provide. And so in that last moment of Samson's life, he said, God, these are the people you've asked me to, to take out. These are the people that were going to end their reign of the Israelites and the Israelites will be free from the tyranny of the Philistines. Give me strength one more time. And so God answers his prayer and he pushes down the pillars of this temple and all the, the, the people who were up on the roof, all the people on the balconies, every, people, every person that was down on the floor, all of these people were crushed to death along with Samson when he brought the temple down on himself and the Philistines. And the rule of the Philistines ended. And I can't stop thinking about how different the story would have been if somebody just said, stop, Samson. Stop worrying about Samson and worry about what God is calling you to do. I think that the story could have been different, that we could have been celebrating him as this incredible, sh strong man of God, but instead we, we see him as being weak-willed and lustful. Somebody who makes decisions based on what he wants, not what's best for the whole community. And because of that, he does eventually accomplish what God has called him to do. Let's be clear. He does destroy the Philistine rule over the Israelites for a time, but in the process, his life comes to ruin. If somebody would have just said, Samson, you're being a real jerk. You know that just because you have strength doesn't mean you can get away with whatever you want. Doesn't mean you can have whatever you want whenever you want it. You have broken your vows to God. You are supposed to be holy. You don't look very holy to me right now with the decisions that you're making. If somebody just would have said, you know you're doing wrong in the sight of God, maybe Samson would be somebody we'd be able to celebrate a little more. It is important for us to surround ourselves with people who are willing to call us out when we make mistakes. In a, let's be clear, in a loving way that is edifying and builds us up rather than tears us down and reminds us that we're scum, right? And not only that, we have to be people of the cross who look at others around us and say, listen, Shelby, you're not getting it right. Margaret, you're missing the point. Alan, you're off by a little bit. Let's refocus. We have to be people that are willing to be called by God and call out others so they can answer the call that God has on their lives too. And it's not easy. And it's going to be very difficult from day to day. But that's what God wants for his holy community. He wants us to be people that look like him in every way that we live so we can tell the world who he is. So friends, as we seek to answer our call from God, I pray that when we are faced with people who call us out for our mistakes, 
that we actually hear them. That we respond to them and we change ourselves in such a way that would make God proud. Friends, let's answer our call this week to both be of God, for God, and like God. Let us do our best to live like Jesus, and let's call each other out when we're not. Let's pray. God, our calling is a gift, but it's a hard gift to live up to. So Lord Jesus, as we learn more about you, as we come here to this place to encounter you, to develop community, to to live like you, God, meet us where we are and help us walk that path. Deliver into our path people who are willing to speak up when we do wrong, people who are willing to love us and take care of us when we fall and make mistakes. God, help us to hear when we're being called out so that we can make adjustments in our walk to make you proud But God, also use us to be the voice of your prophets that say, sometimes you're getting it wrong. Sometimes you're not following the will of God. Sometimes you just got to work a little bit harder. Both of those situations are uncomfortable and awkward and hard at times. But God, equip us to be both called people and people who are willing to call out. Help us to be holy as you are holy. Help us to seek your will and not our own. Help us to fulfill what you've called us to do. And help us to hear those moments when we fall short. God, we love you and we thank you so much for this day and this time. I ask that you be with us as we leave this place. But Before we go, we want to praise you one more time. So God, as we sing our next song, I just ask that your spirit would be made known to us in this place. God, use this time to refresh us. Meet us here, Lord Jesus, as we ask in your holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on today's Community Cast. We hope that you were blessed by today's conversation. If you'd like to know more about Community Brookside, please feel free to visit us at our website, communitybrookside.com or find us on your favorite social media outlet. We hope to hear from you soon. Be blessed.